All righty. So I'm glad that you all chose beauty over whatever GT said was happening over in the other room there. I'm not quite sure what he's talking about. Um, so you're in here obviously because you kind of want to hear about uh, this whole mobility architect and becoming a mobility architect. I will say that I, I do intend to poke the bear, stir the fire, stir the pot, whatever you want to say. Uh, there's one statement at the end that uh, I actually already, already talked to Keith about and he, he and I had a pretty good discussion about it. And um, I'm not, you know, I'm not like dead set on this is going to be the, this is going to be the truth. This is my opinion. And I certainly do appreciate feedback. So please do uh, mention it on Twitter, what, what your thoughts are on. And uh, Lee, this might even be a uh, Wi-Fi Q question possibly that you could present at, at the end there. So who am I? Uh, my name is Blake Crony. For those of you who don't know me, um, at Blake Crony on Twitter, at NSA Show as well. I'm uh, one of the founding members of the No Strings Attached Show, along with Sam Clements, who is the uh, the host. Um, yes, the host with the most, who also helps out on the show. Uh, so podcaster, blogger, uh, mobility architect. I'm an independent consultant as well. I do some independent analysis for uh, vendors have uh, asked us to do some uh, white papers. Cisco had us doing a white paper on um, RxSOP and 2700 uh, stress testing in their facilities in Ohio. And we're actually going to be doing another one here on uh, Halo coming up uh, next week. Actually, we'll be doing that. Uh, CWNE 152 and CCIE uh, 31229. Yes, I got a lot of numbers there. And then, uh, you know, Sean's going to help me get my Aruba ACMX, I'm sure, this year, right, Sean? We're going to set up a plan and we'll make sure I can get whatever I need to to make that happen. <laughs> so here's my first question for all of you. Oh, I'm getting echo. I'm going to step back here. Um, who are you? Who do you classify yourself as today? How many of you classify yourself as a network engineer? You know, you, you touch switches, you touch routers, you touch, you know, firewalls, everything, right? How about an RF engineer? I mean, anybody here only classify themselves as an RF engineer? The only thing I ever do is touch RF? And I don't want to touch anything else. Maybe, you know, that's just, that's your comfort level is, you know, you understand the RF and that's, that's where you see yourself. Wireless engineer. You know, a lot of us, that, there we go, the wireless engineer covers quite a bit of different areas, right? We can have the networking components and everything. An architect, or Sam, the peanut thrower. You know, it doesn't really matter what we classify ourselves as. We all are doing a whole bunch of different duties throughout our, our daily lives and how we get done with our jobs. So as we go through this, is, I want to talk about real quick on a progression of roles, if you will. So very early on, you know, look back into the Talzon days, you're just extending, extending that wired connection somehow through RF means, through a radio frequency. And you really didn't have to care about necessarily large scale devices. How do I have enough you know, DHCP addresses for all these devices? Because I maybe only have two or three devices connect to a single, a single access point or a single device that is creating that 900 megahertz or even 2.4 as it progressed through there. Then we started adding more and more networking. So that's why I started asking, you know, who, is, who considers himself a network engineer? Because then we started having to worry about more things with networking as we added it in uh, WDS, the wireless distribution systems, you know, autonomous mode APs, trying to be cooperative. You know, Andrew mentioned uh, earlier, or Devin called him out on it, about you know, 35,000 access points in a WDS environment. Then we started getting controllers, and now we actually start caring about, okay, where's my DNS? Where's my DHCP? How am I scoping? How am I scaling everything? And we started to really build on the RF and continue into networking. And then now, we're also having to learn virtualization and storage, because we have to go out there and we have to deploy our NMS solutions, our network monitoring solutions. I mean, how many times do you walk into an environment and say, you know, here, Mr. Server, or Mrs. Server Administrator, somebody else, I need you to deploy this OVF, or I need you to deploy and build me this server. A lot of times, we're the ones that are responsible for it as well. We're the ones that have to set it up and everything. So we're kind of stuck into a virtualization and storage as well. And then also, now even more, if we look at high density stadium environments, such as Super Bowl 50 at Levi Stadium, you know, what was one of the big, huge use cases for that venue? Bluetooth low energy with the beacons, being able to know how to get from point A to point B. How can I order things from my phone and have it delivered to my seat? This all requires something else on a server, in the storage. 
so we're starting to branch out, and we have to at least understand to be able to talk about this and ask what we want. You know, are we just going to hand some data sheet over to, to a server administrator and say, okay, here it is, here's the product, go build this for me? Not necessarily. We still are somewhat responsible for that. And then now also we're integrating tools with having to do the Bluetooth low energy and provide these, uh, apply, provide the blue dot navigation, if you will, for people. We're building more software applications. You know, Ryan adds, he builds quite a few different applications and, and that's kind of one of the areas that you know, we're gonna talk about as we go through here is how do, we, how do we progress into this next level of mobility where it's not just you know, the phone or it's not just the laptop, but it's also how do we get data off of everything with IoT and everything else. And then even NAT for network access control. Location services ties in through with all these APIs. So how do you become a mobility architect? Now, this is what I, I wanted to talk about is, you know, in my mind, what do you need to know, at least at the basic level, to get yourself started to be able to understand in a broader sense all these different components that, are, that we really are the ones that are being relied on to understand it. So the first thing that you obviously have to do is you have to learn some kind of programming language. And obviously a lot of us probably didn't, cut into this, didn't get into this uh, networking or get into wireless engineering or get into the RF space to become programmers. But we at least should have a basic understanding of a simple programming language like JavaScript, which, yeah, it may not be considered a programming language because it's in the browser, it's client-based, it's different. But then, you, you know, you should understand JavaScript or Python, PHP, HTML at the very high level because how many times have you had to create a captive portal? I, you know, I despise captive portals, but a lot of people require them. A lot of people want them. And what's the one thing that people always ask us? I want my logo on it. How do I make it match my branding? How does it, you know, how can I do this? The terms, <laughs> the terms of service, you know, how do I change that terms of service? Good point, Sam, so that it's not just the standard canned message that says, welcome to your guest network, you know, and has some vendor's logo on it. A lot of people want that branding. It's very important for them. You know, Sam and I have hit, even had debates before about uh, brand recognition, even in the SSID names. You know, does that, should it match your precise brand with capitalizations and everything? But it's important to them. And if you have to then say, well, yeah, we could customize it, but you know, we need to get your developers, or we need to get your web team involved, and you know, here, here, here's a link that they can go read to do it, it, it might prolong your project. But if you can say, well, here's a sample with all the HTML already predefined in here that you need to have for your form, wrap your branding around it, at least you've given them a foundation to build upon. And you're not an HTML, you're not a web developer, but you've at least got a basic understanding of how this happens so that when you go to help them and they, they come back with you and say, well, can we do this? You can at least understand when you're you know, calling into Cisco, calling into Aruba, calling into whoever, can I do this? Can I load Flash in my captive portal page? Which yes, has been asked of me many a times in the past. They want a Flash video on it for some reason. Yeah, I know. It's, it's, don't even get me started. It's like captive portals are bad enough, but now you want to load all these flash ads or whatever else, you know, flash videos that show this. It's not, you know, not what we want to do. So you've got to have a basic understanding of a programming language. And the three that I've listed up here are very easy to learn. JavaScript is extremely simple to learn. If you can read, you can write JavaScript. It is very basic, very easy to use. Python is a little bit more complex when you're getting into it because you've got to have, understand modules and how to link everything together to make sure you've got the correct module in there and sometimes compile them. PHP, there's so many people out there that have done PHP for the past, I don't know, 10, 12 plus years. There's tons of material on PHP, tons of examples on this. But then you've also got to learn mobile device programming languages. So you should understand, at least at a basic level, some more advanced and device specific languages. Um, iOS has made it, uh, I would say, a lot more easier. You know, you would probably agree with that, Ryan, from creating the Swift application that Swift, now that we have in there instead of Objective C, has made it easier to develop an app and you can get something out quicker. And again, I'm not necessarily saying you all have to be developers. But I'll, you know, we'll, in a couple of slides here, we'll, I'll kind of mention why I think you should have a basic level of this. Android with Java, again, everybody's had Java around for a long time. You know, what, what's the saying? Java's on over 3.2 billion devices in the world, and nobody really 
appreciates that or wants that from a security concern, but it's there. So you, you, know, you can understand that and learn things. Build with the IDEs to help it load up the SDKs. Lots of tools are going to help you out on to understanding it. And the point is, is that, again, we're not trying to develop applications that are going to go into the marketplace or go into the stores, but we might want to develop something that can at least pull advanced driver statistics from an API that's on the device to be able to report that data up as we're trying to troubleshoot a problem that's going on. You know, I think um, the people like uh, Seven Signal and NetBees and others that are, that are really trying to get data off of a client device, you know, they're on the right path. We need to have that client information. So if you can have something that can build a tool that will be able to help you out, that's definitely going to help you out in the long run. Learning the data structures. So this is extremely important because as we go through this and as we progress through the next couple of slides here, I need to get the data from somebody somehow. Everybody has an API into all of their, all of their tools, for, or actually I should say all of their tools, but most all of their tools have APIs, and they're going to return a data format to you in some shape or form. It's either going to be JSON, which is JavaScript object notation, or XML, extensible markup language. Most likely it's going to be XML because it's been around longer, so we have a lot more, uh, a lot more devices out there that are using that. JSON is newer, newish. But uh, as an example here, real quick, this is the JSON format and what it looks like. Pretty easy to understand and read if you just have it you know, spread out on your page. You can see exactly what we're looking at here. We've got a curly bracket that opens it up. We have a glossary dictionary item. We have a title of example glossary. And then we've got a gloss div that has the items in it. What is the title? It's got an S on it, class, the list, the entry. OK, it's an ID. How do we sort it as? What are the terms on it? What's the acronym? So all these items are what's going to be referenceable in a web page, in a report. You know, Brian, you've done a lot of uh, work with the uh, Ekahau, uh, the new version in the 8.x program that has the report builder templates. This looks a little bit familiar, doesn't it? It's when you have to insert this. And this is why I thought this would be an interesting topic is, is that while well, we look at it from a JSON format coming out of an API, other vendors that we use are bringing them into their products where they want us to format data tags into their application in such a way that makes it so that we can then get pretty images out of our surveys and put them into a highly customizable report that then makes it so you don't have a canned report and then some customer come back and say, I paid you how much to do a survey and give me a canned report? We can give them a customized report now. So really easy to read and it's going to have a lot of information that's getting back to us and then obviously if we had multiple titles, there would be more under there and then we would just kind of walk through that process through in our, uh, in our web page or whatever we're reading the data into that would um, format that for us. So the next one that I mentioned was XML. XML is uh, kind of as pretty, but it's a lot more strict. And I say it's a lot more strict because what we've got is we've got um, open and then close tags on all the items. And if you don't have your close tag, it's not going to work. And you can't have as much of the data inside of the tags because if you have certain special characters, it's going to puke at you. If you want to actually have things like an at symbol inside of there, or if you want to have uh, quotes inside of there, it starts messing up your data. So it's not going to give as much data back to you that's actually usable in the, in the long run. So the, that's why JSON is a lot, you know, a lot cleaner of a format, a lot easier to use uh, going forward into it. So two structures, those are the primary ones that you're going to see from all the vendors uh, as we go through and kind of talk through some of these next couple of steps here of what's going on. So the key here is, is that you need to experiment. You have to just be willing to go out and try these things and then make the queries to the APIs to see what the results are. Now, a good example of this was um, one that uh, Ryan and I were working on uh, not too long ago. We were looking at how to get information out of the CMX API, so the Cisco Connected Mobile Experience API. At the time, there wasn't much data or wasn't much guides, you know, how to get all this information out of it. But one of the things that you can do really quickly and really easily is that if you're running Firefox, you can download, an, uh, download a little, little um, extension called Firebug. And I actually recommend downloading and installing Firebug just just because whenever you're using browsers, because it will tell you what's taking so long, what's, uh, you know, where, where did it break on a, 
on a JavaScript page load, even if you're not necessarily the one that's writing the app or writing the web page that you're trying to look at, it, it's great for troubleshooting. I've, I've used it many a times to troubleshoot with my wife on what they're trying to do at their work. But the Firebug gives me a console that shows all of the items that are being loaded, all of the assets, the JavaScript pages, the images, the CSS, everything. And I can step through and I can see exactly what's going on. The benefit for helping you with APIs is that if you're using the GUI, for example, on Cisco CMX, that GUI is making the same API calls that you would then end up making, and it's returning the JSON data, it's returning that data payload back into it, and then it's formatting it. So by using the Fire Debug Console, I can see how is Cisco formatting their request into the API to get the data and then display the data. And I never once had to crack open any developer guides or any API manuals or anything. I am simply loading the, loading the GUI that is provided to me. And I can see all these requests happening in real time. And once I have these requests in my hand, you can start to look at it. And if you start kind of parsing through that, that URL string, you'll see things like you know, param or filter. You start keying in on variable names in that string. And then you can start to say, okay, well, maybe what happens if I tweak this? What happens if I change this date range? Or what happens if I change this ID for, you know, what, what it would be a building ID or a, a campus ID or a network ID? There's also uh, the developer tools on Safari if you're using uh, OS X. So you can load up that. Um, you, have to, uh, you have to go under the preferences and, and enable advanced, uh, de uh, advanced developer tools so that you get a developer dropdown. Works the same exact way. It gives me a console, lets me see where everything is, shows me what's going on. So now I can parse that information and I can look at it and I can build what I want to by using somebody else's already provided uh, scripts and already provided pages. So that's the, you know, the quick and easy way of getting involved in this is experiment. And that's exactly how I started out in doing this. You know, when I went to school at the University of Minnesota, I knew for a fact I did not want to do programming. I was forced to take C++ and uh, Scheme and, and Java. And as I was going through these, I'm like, I really hate programming. I can't sit here and I can't do this. There's no way I can just sit and type away, compile, hope it works. I mean, that's, that's just not, that's not something that I liked. I liked debugging it. I liked using the, the debuggers and figure out where things broke, but I didn't like trying to make it work. So being able to launch these tools like the Fire Debug is what really, or Firebug, excuse me, is what helps you quickly and easily get involved in this and understand what's going on without actually having to learn necessarily how to program. You just have to be able to load up a page. So why do I think that this is important, this whole becoming a mobility architect? Why am I up here talking about APIs to RF engineers, network engineers, wireless engineers? The reason is, is because we have to evolve from tech to business. You know, for, for the first few years in the industry that I was in here, wireless was still just a hotspot connectivity. It was in a conference room. You put an AP in a conference room and people were happy. They weren't going from their desk over to their conference room and keeping the laptop open and hoping to have connectivity the entire time. They shut it down, they walk over to the conference room, they open it back up and they get online. Or if they're in a, a university, the students go to the, go to the classroom, go to the auditorium and maybe maybe less than 5% less than probably would have wanted to be, get online. Everybody else was still rocking paper. So now what's happening is, is that we have to evolve from just technology-focused minded people into business, you know, business development people. We have to be able to understand what are the business needs for an organization. We have to understand what are their workflows. You know, we, we don't just walk into an environment and say, okay, I'm gonna put an access point here, 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 and here, and call our good. We want to understand, you know, what do we ask our customers or what do we ask everybody that we're working with? What are you doing on the network? What are your clients supposed to do? How are you enabling mobility? You know, what is your workflows of your employees? You know, how many people have done hospitals where they say, we don't need any coverage in the stairwells? Where's the number one place that doctors and nurses go to make phone calls? The stairwells. How do doctors and nurses get in between the floors? The stairwells, because they don't want to wait for the elevators. So we have to understand what everybody's actual workflows are in there to be able to develop a solution that works for them. And a lot of the times, 
This is involving application use cases. It doesn't have anything to do with RF necessarily. Because if I just put an AP in, in the stairwell, I've got coverage, right? So I'm, I'm good. Now we're trying to understand what are they actually using? Are they using Link in there? Are they using Jabber in there? What's going on in there? But the important thing though too also remember is don't forget your tech background still. Because our tech background is going to be what enables all those workflows and enables through APIs and applications the usage of our wireless networks or even our wired networks for that matter. If our networks don't work, it doesn't matter what the applications do because it's never going to happen. The applications have to work in order for our networks to be successful. So why should you become a mobile, a mobility architect? You know, why should you consider yourself changing from an RF engineer, a network engineer, a wireless engineer to a mobility architect? I've said this already a few times. I don't want to be a developer. I totally agree with all of you. I don't want to be a developer. I don't want to have to support applications. I don't want to have to, you know, handle the tech support calls of why does this not work on this Android device that was four years old that I still want to use because I haven't upgraded on it. Or why doesn't this even work on the latest generation of the device because I haven't gotten around to coding to it. It's about widening your base. And I know Jake is over in the other side of the room, but he actually said this on Twitter the other day, and it makes perfect sense for everything. Even if you want to be siloed, and you want to have your, your tower going way up high on your single focus RF, or your single focus whatever it might be, if you don't have a sturdy enough base and a sturdy enough foundation, you're going to topple over. So again, you should understand at least at a bare minimum enough to get you by to be able to support, support you going forward. Proof of concepts help prove it works and then outsource to the development house. You know, this is one of, my, one of my most favorite stories about this whole proof of concepts and APIs is back in, um, back in 2007, we were talking with a very large mall located in, in Minnesota where I'm from, and they wanted to figure out a solution for tracking kids and parents. Because the number of kids that go missing on a daily basis is extremely high. And I can totally understand after being there on Sunday with my two kids, it was a madhouse. So many people there. So they asked us, okay, how can you, you know, can we use wireless? What can we use to track kids and their parents and alert somehow when things are going on? So the first thing we did is we looked at, okay, what are our vendor solutions? We've got Echohow RTLS and we got AeroScout RTLS, two RTLS solutions at the time that we can use. So we settled on, uh, on using AeroScout for it. And the first thing that they're, they're asking was, is, okay, so how can you put together a quick little demo for us? You know, what, what's going to be involved in this? Because I have a very basic understanding, at least of PHP and MySQL databases, what I was able to do is I was able to develop a command center, if you will, app that ran that connected to our, our Cisco phones for using the XML pushes to make and receive phone calls, connected to wireless cameras that we put up into the environment to, for the testing, and then connected to the AeroScout APIs to combine us all together so that when a parent, because they had a tag, separated from the kid, because they had a tag as well, when that distance was greater than a preset limit, it set off all these bells and whistles. And it started alerting, it called into the security cameras, it called into the uh, security operator using the Cisco APIs for the phones. And then I was able to show on the, on the web display, I was able to click a picture of the kid and push it down to the wireless 7921 phone that the person was using in the environment. And a lot of people, they were looking at this and they're like, well, this is kind of a, kind of a half-assed joke that you just put together because you're using all these South Park avatars that I had created. But I created it in a weekend. You laugh, but I'm, I'm serious. I used that, you know, South Park yourself and for a lot of people's images because we didn't have time to take a bunch of pictures of everybody. But what happened at the end of it was is that because we were able to build this solution in a weekend that then proved how all these systems could in fact be tied together, they're like, okay, this is great. We definitely want to talk more about it. Unfortunately, when they found out how much everything was going to cost, it kind of got sideburned for nine years because they finally just deployed some of the tracking at the mall now. But the point is, is that these proof of concepts, they can help you at least show what's possible. Again, it's not supposed to be a productized version that you're selling. But at least you understood it to the point where you were able to depict what could be done with the environment. You know, I've sat through quite a few of the atmosphere keynotes where things are being shown that you look at it and you're like, 
okay, I know that this can be done because they're showing it to me. I know that on the back end, there's quite a bit of work that's going through with, through the API with ClearPass to be able to enable that door lock to happen because I have to detect the tag, then detect to see who they are through the ClearPass APIs to see who it is, then to trigger some, some little fidget that unlocks the door. So we see that happen and we're like, okay, this is a total proof of concept because when, when they first demoed that, that wasn't a productized version. That was just, hey man, look what we can do. And then last year when he had um, uh, Robin talk about the conference rooms, now we've got products that are, are built on this. But those proof of concepts are what helps you at least get, the, get that point across that, hey, this is possible. We can do this. It's going to take a little bit of work. But that's when you contract with a development house, or that's when you find somebody who actually does app development work and say, okay, now that I've built this proof of concept and they understand and they see what's possible on it, how do we do it? But that doesn't have to be you, and it really shouldn't be you. I mean, who, who wants to be a programmer, seriously? <laughs> hey, I'll give you credit, man. I, well, yeah, Adrian's back there too, because we want you to keep being a programmer, so please do keep being a programmer. But a lot of us don't necessarily want to be programmers because we don't want to have to go through the support of, you know, like I said, trying to troubleshoot all the issues going across there. So the next reason, IoT. I know buzzwords, yeah, we'll, we'll do, I'm um, between you and beer and liquor, bourbon, whatever they got out there so everybody can do the shots when we get out there for saying this buzzword, but it really is a big deal. Sensors are going to be popping up onto these networks. BLE devices are popping up onto our networks. And what are they all doing? They're spewing data. Where's that data going? It's going into a database. You know, Brian, a lot of your devices, you're kind of already been doing Internet of Things for years before the buzzword even came out. Your devices are sending data up. And at some point in time, that data needs to be accessed. A lot of people can access that through APIs and be able to combine it into all the different dashboards out there. So IoT is definitely going to be driving this, this change, if you will, to more of a mobility architect because you're not, again, just troubleshooting some laptop or some iPhone. Now you're troubleshooting some embedded device that probably has a really bad wireless card that they've got thousands of them on the infrastructure and they want you to tie all this data in. And you know, sometimes it could be network monitoring devices because we've got vendors that are putting together sensors to be able to, you know, to Devin's point about being able to read from the client device what, what's going on. You know, that's what we're starting to see as well. So here's my, oh, and Lee's not even in here for right now. He stepped out, but here's my statement. Wi-Fi will become a commodity. RF will become a commodity. This is going to become easy. And I see a lot of people are kind of like, what, you know, what's going on with this? Well, vendors are making it quote unquote easy to deploy. And I'm kind of glad that this happened right after Devin's talk on RM, because this is really the thing is that if vendors are making Wi-Fi so easy to deploy with simple to use GUIs, set up wizards, you know, take it out of the box and deploy it, what's left for us? You know, if everything is so easy to deploy, where's our next steps? Are our next steps what rides on top of the wireless? 802.11n to AC wave one to wave two. We didn't change our AP placements. We didn't necessarily change our densities. You know, we might have changed our densities if they did a really bad deployment from 802.11g to 802.11n and did a one for one there, which then they found out was really a bad idea and didn't work. Now we need to add more density. We need to change up our design. But we're getting to a point where almost RF design is stale. You know, I know Sam loves his AP on the sticks, but I would actually, you know, there's some environments that I would argue an AP on the stick doesn't necessarily give you value. A stadium is almost one of them. For a stadium design, I, we all know the complexities behind running and operating a stadium environment. You know, there's some awesome stats that came out about the Super Bowl and, and what, what was pushed through there, but was that done with an AP on the stick? You know, when you walk into a stadium, you've only got a few options for how you're gonna make this work. You're gonna have, well, uh, something, GT's dropped a bomb over there. <laughs> um, you've, you've got to have this where you've got canopy, you've got direct seat, under seat, whatever you wanna call it, handrail. You've only got so many placements that you can work with. So if this isn't gonna change, 
and if the AP placements aren't necessarily going to change even as we grow within different standards as they come out because we're still operating within the same confinements of our RF, what's left for us to do? You know, this is where it becomes possibly a commodity because we're just taking one, pay, one AP out and putting another AP back in. We have to make sure the applications that are running on the network are now what matters. We have to make sure that it's tuned for the applications. And kind of the, the, the big thing about this all is that everything in our technology environment everywhere right now is this whole disruption. You, know, you either need to disrupt or you're going to be disrupted. If you look at what's happening in this space with Uber, Lyft, Zipcar, all of these up here, you know, Uber doesn't own a single physical item. They don't own any cars. They have drivers working for them. They were a disruption to a, to a major marketplace. Technology has to have disruptions. And in the wireless world, we're kind of at that place right now where I feel is that if you're just sitting there being, in a, being a wireless engineer, sure, you're still going to have the jobs of doing surveys or doing validation work. You know, bridge links are kind of a different thing because that's always RF focused. That's not really focused on anything else. We, we've got to understand RF and how to work through on that. But inside of the carpet space, inside of universities, inside of stadiums, inside of corporate headquarters, the way that we're going, everything is just, it's just applications. We are almost to the point where our wireless networks are the wired infrastructure. Anybody can install a switch in an environment. Sure, there's some of the advanced routing that goes on, but the switch is just put a switch in, plug in a cable. Wireless is almost to that point where you just fire up your laptop and you go and it works. There was an interesting stat that was on Twitter today that the, the percentage of people that would just blindly connect to any wireless network is extremely high. And they don't care about security. They don't care about anything. What do they care about? They care about their Snapchat. They care about their Instagram. They care about Periscope. They, you know, they just care about being connected. So now, what are we actually trying to monitor and what are we trying to manage? We're trying to monitor and manage applications. We're trying to make sure that those applications work. The RF is the RF. It doesn't change what's happening in there. You know, the application just has to get through. So what do you think? You know, do you think that you're more of a mobility architect now? Or is RF still what's just important? I mean, where, where do you work, if you don't mind sharing? Because you said that you're an RF engineer. Philips Healthcare? So, <laughs> so for you, for, for client connectivity devices, you know, you're just trying to get a device online. So RF is, is, your, main, is your main goal? So continuous monitoring. So if you're trying to do continuous monitoring of something, does the RF necessarily matter? You're caring about making sure that just data is flowing. So now we need to have that real-time stats. We need to have that API to understand, am I constantly getting data from my devices? Whatever means that is, are we pinging it? Are we checking SMP polls? What, you know, maybe there's a, a, a TCP stream that we can monitor coming inbound and make sure things are happening. But that's really, you're now down into the application monitoring and you're almost off RF because, you know, what, what do people say is that, Everybody blames our wireless networks. Everybody blames our RF, correct, whenever there's a problem. But if it says I'm connected and it says I'm associated, RF may not necessarily be the problem. It could be, but it might not be. So it's an interesting place to be in where you consider yourself an RF engineer and really the primary, the, the bulk of your, of your work is really is making sure a TCP flow happens. So depends on the site. Depends on the site. Okay, so more uh, any, any type of RF interference source, you want to collect all that information and, and pull it all together. But I think that's, you know, that's kind of the interesting part of, about all of this is, is that you know, you're collecting all that, all that data. Where is that data going to go? How do I access that data? How do I use that data? Well, 
which hopefully all of us can find the source of the interference and then eliminate it. That's definitely the key. There's a lot of times that we find the source of interference and we can't, we can't eliminate it. So it's one of those things that, you know, for, for what we're doing in our environments and where we're at, you know, again, this is what I was saying is, is that, you know, it's not necessarily that everybody has to switch to be mobility architects or that's not where we're all going to be going. But at the same time, when you're looking at this, you know, how many times are you touching a controller? How many times are you touching an access point? How many times are you troubleshooting those compared to how many times you're troubleshooting an application? Or how many times are you trying to collect data and bring it into prime infrastructure or airwave where you're trying to, you know, bring everything together into one spot? You're, you're pulling everything in and that's, that's kind of more where you're getting into these applications and APIs. So that's kind of why, you know, what I'm looking at it is that as we evolve and as you have to learn to understand the business use cases, becoming more of a mobility ar architect helps you see the bigger picture. So again, you've still got your, your area that you, that you focus on and you've got that base to help you understand what's going on. So I was between you and liquor. So I ended up going through that a little bit faster than I, than I, than I thought. But um, we've got time here. If anybody's got any other questions or anything that, that they want to ask, please do go ahead. Yes, Sean. Yep. Yeah, and that's definitely something that uh, I think Halo, and not meaning Cisco's hyperlocation, but the 900 megahertz H A L O W, awesome naming for that. I, I think that's one of those interesting pieces is that how many folks are going to be dedicated to just understanding that? and then other folks still sticking with two, four or five gigahertz traditional Wi-Fi as we know it today. You know, it's almost one of those things that, you know, you make a great point is, is that, are we going to be expected to understand that? And are we going to be expected to have the tools to check that spectrum, to do those packet captures and everything? Or is that going to be another group, another, another department within, you know, within your organization? It, it starts to, it starts to go into it is that, all of us, you know, wireless was the, was the name used, but you know, RF engineering can mean how many different frequencies, and RF, like you said, can mean just interference. DC to the light. Exactly, DC to the light, yeah. You've, you're just talking about this as radio frequency terms, but so much of us have been focused on, well, it's 802.11G, it's 802.11A, when it's not. And that's really why we're starting to be this all-encompassing person that has to support multiple things. And Bluetooth beacons is certainly something that's popping up. Um, that's a good point that I, I, I meant to hit on is that, you know, there, there's a lot of people that look at Bluetooth beacons as this really bad source of interference, which a lot of Bluetooth beacons operate up on the higher channels of 2.4. So they're not even anywhere near traditional wireless. So when you have you know, thousands of these beacons deployed at a stadium, you're not going to have a hit. But we still have to understand it, right? It raises the noise floor a little bit, yep. But it's not as bad as, say, somebody that has an old Bluetooth 3 headset that definitely is on top of 1, 6, and 11, or somewhere right in there. No, good point, Sean. Any other questions?
Exactly, and that's the, that's the point of the APIs is that all that data we can't get unless if we look into the APIs. There's so much data that, data that is collected but not, not shown anywhere necessarily. And a lot of that is thinking out of, outside of the box and developing custom solutions, which goes into the whole proof of concepts of at least being able to do that. You know, you don't need to be, you don't need to be somebody like Retail Next or Euclid's that has the algorithms, has the data scientists that are looking at all of that data and trying to figure out what the workflows or what the um, movement flows are between point A to point B. But if we can at least be able to pull through it, and that's what Ryan and I were working on a lot of with um, the Meraki dashboard as well, is how do we at least just get this information into another database that then somebody else can query and use and run and take all their exports out? And so much of so much of this is what I do from from working with customers in, in wireless space with retail is, yeah, I'm just trying to get this out of this API into some database that your team understands and knows how to query to develop their own custom queries so that they can figure it out because maybe a GUI doesn't give it to us yet or what the GUI does give us doesn't show us how the data we want to see from a year over year change. But this is exactly the type of conversations that we're responsible to have now because it runs on wireless. So all of a sudden we have to be these experts in analytics. We have to understand the APIs. We have to understand databases and how to bring that data over so that when they ask us, can we do this? We can say, yes, we can. So it's definitely, definitely a huge change in analytics is, analytics is certainly one, one of the technologies that brought this to the forefront because it's the most, you know, most important one to a lot of people because retail, what sells? stats. And as we get things with Apple Pay and other tokenized payment systems, you're losing that tracker, which was the credit card number, and we have to look for something else. And the MAC address is a perfect example of what we could possibly use if we tie it to the loyalty card through an application installed on the phone, right? <laughs> Lee. So SDN is an interesting one because the, so yeah, so software defined networking, how does this play into the APIs and everything that we have? And it almost gets to the point where does software defined networking matter in wireless? So. Oh, geez. So, so no, so, so Jonathan, you, you kind of, you kind of led me in, into that because that's exactly what I was going to say is that, so when I, um, I attended a Cisco Live a few years ago when Cisco launched their 1PK product. And prior to the launch, we had a little sit down with, with some of the team and, and they're asking questions. And, and I'm that, I'm that redheaded stepchild in the room. I'm the wireless guy that, you know, one of the only ones that was there. Ryan, you were there too, weren't you with me? And, and we were asking, we we're like, well, how does this impact wireless? We're not, we're going to have, these tools come to wireless. But does it really matter because once the wireless is onto a wired packet, that's when the SDN takes over. So how much do I truly need with SDN through APIs into my controller? Because a controller essentially is kind of, in a way, software-defined networking, kind of, sort of. Yeah, you could maybe consider it. But I'm not necessarily gonna have some application that is doing traffic weighting measurements and then doing per packet switching because I can't switch it on the wireless. I'm not going to do a per packet switch on a wireless flow from one AP to another AP. So it really software defined network and I don't necessarily see it playing too much into the APIs that are in wireless controllers or in wireless access points or NMS solutions. I could see it referencing information that is being presented in there to maybe try to make a determination that if, you, if you're one of those that believes 2.4 isn't dead and you have clients on there and maybe you want to try to persuade it through another means to move. You know, actually, an interesting use case that um, somebody was mentioning to me the other day was uh, their 2.4 clients were on a different VLAN than their 5 gigahertz clients. And I thought that was extremely strange. I was like, why, why would you ever do that? Like, because now I have a way to count how many 2.4 clients there are versus 5 gigahertz clients because my big gateways I have don't give me that information. So I think there might be some interesting tie-ins between the two, but will software-defined networking drive wireless networking? 
Probably not, because isn't our goal to get a wireless client to be treated as a wired device as quickly as possible? I mean, that's what certain people's <clears throat> unified access or other products were, were attempting to do. So. I think, I think one area that we may see um, maybe some change there is as LTE is pushing down into five gigahertz, we're also seeing devices like you know these guys, the Apple devices, that also will now go between go to LTE and Wi-Fi even at the same time. So we may see a little bit more management and control over radios, and, and that really kind of opens up the, the definition of what is a wireless engineer, right? Exactly. Because it's no longer just about Wi-Fi, as we said before. It's not just 900 megahertz, 2.4, and, and 5 gig. Now we're also talking about LTE. Yep. And that also, again, goes to those API calls. Yep, and that... that ties exactly in with Sean's point about how as we as these devices open up to multiple frequency bands that I mean we could we could foresee seeing a device that could use cellular halo and Wi-Fi all at the same time for more bandwidth if they never needed it right. I mean that's certainly going to be a possibility and that's where again are we going to be siloed and stick to just I understand the 802.11 AC spec and I don't care about what's going to happen with halo or do I need to know both? Because my device is going to support both, and it's going to roam somehow between both. And if I have to support a seamless handoff somehow, because I have some sort of you know, gateway device in theory that could be developed, I mean, it's definitely going to be interesting to see what happens. And that's, you know, you're right. That's why we're switching towards you know, these terms. And again, a title is a title. What, what does a title give you? It might give you a certain salary grade or a certain pay scale. but. At the end of the day, it doesn't matter. It's what do you understand? And hopefully that's where you're getting your certifications that show that, right? Yep. You know, I, I, so I'll, re, I'll repeat it and paraphrase it up as uh, white box APs. Why don't we have all these white box APs running around? And one reason why is because we have vendors out there that are spending a ton of time and a ton of cycles ensuring that the features that they're putting together will in fact work. So now if I go and have an SDN style play where I've got five different vendors, I mean, CapWap was supposed to be a standard where anybody could play in it. But there's pieces in between it that you know interoperability was never not brought onto it because not everything is designed the same way. So how how could I ensure that end user experience when I've got an AP manufactured one way and the client is roaming to another AP that's manufactured to a different spec with different internal and in, internals in it? You know if they're all using the same chip, that might be different. Yeah. Yeah, Sam's point about Cucumber Tony, so for those of you that aren't, aren't familiar with Cucumber Tony, it's a, a open open software that can, uh, how do you, yeah, de-brick de your, de your Meraki access points. So there certainly is value and can happen. I mean, look at, I mean, if we really want to be honest, look at what BlueSocket was doing when it was first deployed. It was just an access controller gateway that you could plug any access point in behind and it provided authentication, quote unquote, through to it. So I think that would be kind of a pipe dream. It would be nice, but what's the value proposition in it for somebody? Sure.
<laughs> exactly, as, as Ryan said, everybody would have to follow the standards and they'd have to follow them. They'd have to follow them precisely all the exact same way. Everybody's interpretation would have to be exactly the same way as well, which highly unlikely would happen. Would it be nice? Sure. Right, and I, and I think you know, that's exactly the point of RF being possibly a commodity in two to three years, is because we could potentially get to the point where you know, the fact is that the access points can't, they're no longer gonna be $1,100, $1,200, $1,400, whatever the case may be. There's, the volume that we're pushing on these allows the price to be lowered. The spec is not changing as much as frequently you know, we're kind of, the past few years have been unique because we've had such this rapid progression through all the different changes with bandwidth, with channels and everything. But we're getting to a, kind of a plateau point where now we're getting into Halo and other different technologies that could come up that are going to require even completely new infrastructure or maybe a module for, for people that support modularity on their access points. But it's one of those things that the access points themselves, if we sell more by volume, hopefully that means that the cost is going to be lowered. So then we don't necessarily need the white box label that could then introduce issues. But then also that's, you know, we're becoming more, more into programmers to lease points on software defined networks. You know, the wired networking folks, they've seen this as, do I now become a programmer? Am I forced to become a programmer because I have to learn Python to actually be able to manage my switches? You know, at least for us right now where we're at is that we don't have to, we're not being forced to learn a programming language to configure our switches, our configure our controllers and our access points. We are being prodded to learn a programming language to be able to extend the data that is being collected on our networks because we have this concept of mobility. It's very easy to track somebody. It's very easy to engage with people that are on the wireless networks. So. Great topics on SDN and the white box. I think that's going to be something that should maybe be, you know what, if you're going to come to the No Strings Attached show podcast tomorrow, let's talk about that. Because I actually would want to talk more, more in, depth, in detail about that. Glenn. PHP, Python. Yeah, Ryan says this crazy Python language thing. I'm a Perl junkie. I, 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 I came up with Perl, so. Perl is better. It's what I started. So Perl kind of easily evolved into PHP for me. So PHP was really easy for me to learn. But honestly, I do agree with Ryan. And Ryan is going to not let me ever forget that I just said that statement. But Python is the language of SDN. A lot of devices and a lot of vendors have Python modules. So if you were completely starting from scratch, I would start with Python. Python for wireless controllers. So there's a lot. There's already libraries out there. So the, I mean, that's the thing is that it doesn't matter what you. This is like the whole VI versus Vim versus Emacs versus Nano discussion. It doesn't matter what you use as long as you know what you're using. And thankfully we have that website called Google that lets us search and learn about all this stuff to be able to understand it. So it's really, it's pick a language. I think if you're gonna be only focusing and worrying about um, guest access engagement and tying in and customizing things like um, ICE and ClearPass uh, login pages for capture portals, then it's just JavaScript and HTML is all you really need to know. You might dabble a little bit in PHP because somebody might wanna get some sort of variable or from something and add into it. But if you truly actually want to um, really get involved with reading the, reading the APIs and bringing them into databases, that's probably where Python and things like MongoDB are gonna be, 
be your better choice because it's what a lot of people, it's the hip thing to do now. Right, Ryan? Python? Hip. See, again, I started all this stuff back in 2000 when, when it was Perl. And yes, I hated myself. Why do you think I said I didn't like being a programmer? It's because I had to do a lot of Perl. And I just, I always remember when I was done for the day, I purposely broke the code so I could know where I needed to go back to when I was working. But no, it's a good, good question, Glenn. I'd, Python, if you're starting fresh, otherwise, you know, PHP, if you have any sort of programming background of a scripting language, because that's essentially what it is. And, mm -hmm. All right, time for just maybe one or two more questions before probably Keith comes back in here and does more drawings, or like I said, we can break. So I want to thank everybody. Um, you know, again, if you have any other questions, you know, hit me up on Twitter or, you know, come to the podcast and let's talk white label APs because hopefully maybe Jake will be there because uh, Jake Snyder, he's actually, he's actually talked about that before in the past about could we do white label APs and didn't he even write his own CapWap controller? Yeah, he started to write his own CapWap controller. He's one of those guys that I wish I, wish I had his, his brain on, on the programming and some of the stuff he does because he just sits down and he does things. And the same with the Wi-Fi pineapples. And I'm like, well, how did you even think to do this? And, and, okay, but so, all right, thank you.